our family likes to. Uh, on Friday is our family night in our home. And um, usually I've had a busy week at church and our family has been busy either with school or activities or concerts. And so Friday night, the family knows that dad is theirs. I am theirs. Uh, we'll make pizza. Trudy makes homemade pizza and we'll rent a movie. And, and a few years ago, we watched a very interesting movie. It was called Secondhand Lions. Doesn't matter if you've heard of it or even if it's available. But here was the, the story. This little boy had come to live with his two uncles and his two uncles were fabulous storytellers. The hard part was discerning if his two uncles were telling the truth. They would tell incredible stories of when they served in World War II. They told about serving in the French Foreign Legion and that one of them even had a relationship. He won the heart of an Arabian princess and the stories were grand and grandiose and were wonderful. And the boy, because he had come out of a very difficult situation, was just enjoying their stories. But there was a point in the movie where one night the boy and one of his uncles was standing out by a lake and it was dark. And the little boy and his uncle were talking and they were talking about truth. Because the boy was trying to discern if the stories were true and if his uncles were really real in what they were saying. And his uncle said this to them, and this is a very telling commentary on our society. The uncle said, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. What matters is whether or not you believe it. If you believe it, then it is true, that's enough. I'd like to repeat that. It doesn't matter if it is true or not. What matters is that whether or it, what matters is whether or not you believe it. If you believe it, then it is true, that's enough. That's what our culture is trying to say. It doesn't matter whose truth is right. If you believe it, that's okay. If you believe one thing and you believe another thing and they have a conflict with each other, you just go ahead and believe your own truth. That 20 centuries after Paul wrote this letter, the same problems of truth and what passed to follow are still there today in just a variety of different ways. So what voices am I supposed to listen to? How am I supposed to know what path to follow? Paul gives us a prescription in that second set of verses, verses 6 through 10. He says to Timothy in verse 6, If you put these things before the brothers, you'll be a good servant of Jesus Christ, being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Timothy, teach what you have learned. Teach what I have taught you. Teach the truth about Jesus Christ and what He came to do and get it into their hearts and the words of the faith and the good doctrine. You've been following it, Timothy. They're watching your life. They're watching your example. Verse 7, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourselves for God in this. Timothy, they're going to argue about everything. They're going to have this story and they're going to have that story and they're going to think this and, and they're going to argue about that. He says, Timothy, don't waste your time. He says, train yourself for godliness. And that becomes one of the solutions to this problem. What am I going to do? How am I going to be able to follow the path that God has for me? His words right here, train yourself for godliness. That idea has the idea of being nourished constantly that you are being fed, that you are, are training for something. It's a picture of a baby who never gets enough to eat. At a certain stage of a baby's life, they're growing and their body is changing and their bones are growing. And it's like they can't eat enough and they just take and take and take. He says, Timothy, you have to constantly nourish. You have to constantly have this proper diet, feasting on the Word of God. We go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 15, which say this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Timothy, you have to feast on the Word of God. Timothy, you have to feast and eat and soak in the things that will nourish your soul and you have to share that with other people. And he says, when you feast on, when you let these godless myths and these old wives' tales come in, he says, that's spiritual junk food. Do you know what junk food is? In America, we have an expression called junk food. It's a bottle of pop and a bag of potato chips 
or it's unhealthy food that we just like to nibble on when we watch a movie or when we sit around and have conversation. It's not healthy food, but it tastes good. I, I like junk food myself. I can sit and watch a movie and nibble on this or that. And he says, it's not good for me. Timothy, that's what this is. When they argue about these different speculations, it's just spiritual junk food. Timothy, eat things that are healthy for you. Savor and soak in these things that will enhance your spiritual development. But he's not done. Not only should we have a proper diet, at the end of verse 7, he says, train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Timothy. So he's thinking like an athlete. Timothy, when you eat right and when you exercise, you're going to be at maximum health. Timothy, I don't want you to just feed your people the truth. I want you to show them how to live it. Remember, belief drives behavior. If you feed them the belief part and you help them see how that affects how they live, that's how they're going to be spiritually healthy. The word for, for train is the word from which we get gymnasium, or we shorten it to say gym. And I think it was so appropriate that Paul would use that image because in the Greek and Roman world, the Olympics and the training and these arenas where the races would occur was central to their life. He says, Timothy, take the image of the local competition in the arena that they have there. And he says, I want you to take that image and plant it in your head because I want you to be exercising the things that you learn. And I want you to share that with your family, uh, with your church. I think of an example. I, I talked about the French Alps when I started here today. Uh, the Tour de France is being run right now. There's some American bicycle riders in this race that I, I have enjoyed following over the years, and they've, some of them have won the variety of races. But if you know anything about this particular bicycle race, they race through France for about 2,000 miles over a period of about 20 days, I think it is. Sometimes they race on passages that are completely flat and then they get into the French Alps and they ride up these mountains that are so steep you go, how can their legs possibly churn? For you to be able to enter the Tour de France, you have to be in peak physical condition. It's the longevity of time that they race. It's the severity of the conditions that they will face. So they have been eating right. They have been exercising right. Their lungs are at maximum capacity. Their bodies are lean and light for riding these bicycles. And they ride in teams so that the wind effect is shared by each one. It's just a great picture of what Paul is trying to illustrate here. He says, Timothy, you've got to help your people be in such spiritual condition that they can sniff these deviant teachings a mile away and say, no, I'm not going to follow that path. I'm not going to follow that path. There's some people that I would encourage as you listen to this to say, are you feeding on the truth of God's Word? Are you exercising, putting into practice what you have come to learn? For some of you, I'd say, you know what, you're never going to get in shape if you don't start. You say, I became a Christian, but you know, I got too busy and it was fun for a little while. I say, please, get going. Continue feeding, continue exercising. There are some of you who have been Christians for a long time and you say, I'm getting tired and I, and I don't know what to do. I said, maybe you need to just slow down the pace, but don't stop taking in the nourishment of God's Word. Don't stop putting into practice the things that you do. God loves you. God gave His Son for the world. He didn't want the world to perish. He has a desire that everyone comes to know Him and a relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, I can transform your life. But don't stop. Engage. Learn. Put it into practice. So let me ask you a question. What does your spiritual feeding and exercise look like? Are you feeding on spiritual junk food? In America, we have so many different flavors of spirituality to feast on. Some are very light, it's like eating candy. Some are very deep and rich. Some are not even close to the truth and some are variations of the truth. And whatever, whatever culture you are, whatever country you are in, I would ask you the same question because the situations are the same in every country. What kind of spiritual food are you taking in and what means of exercise are you using to put it into practice? 
Because Paul is encouraging Timothy to say, Timothy, please, you must continue in this journey. Don't give up. The distractions are coming. Things are happening in your church and in your communities. You must keep going, Timothy. He closes it out in verse verse 9 and 10, just simply with this statement. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. That's what will keep you going. You're focused on the prize. You're focused on, on meeting Jesus Christ on the end of this life when we will savor all that this life has prepared us for. Timothy, if you get tired, when you get tired, when you feel weak, Keep your focus and your attention and your hope on the living God. I think of the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 when he said, fixing our eyes on Jesus, not giving up. Because Jesus Christ finished the race. He completed it. The crowd of witnesses is there encouraging us on. You can do it in the power and strength that Jesus Christ gives you. There are paths to follow in life. The paths that Timothy was facing and the people of his church were facing were trying to take him here and trying to take him here. And, and Paul says to Timothy, keep going down that same path. Eat right. Nourish yourself in the Word of God, in relationships with other Christian people, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. That's how you exercise putting your faith into practice. Timothy, don't give up. Keep going. Eat right. Exercise. And keep your focus on the God of glory who's waiting for us at the end of this journey. That brings us to the end of this section. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS resource base, please visit tvseminary.com. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.